Good morning, everyone. My name is Christine Anderson from OCFS. I act as the anti-trafficking and runaway and homeless youth program coordinator here for the Division of Youth Partnership and Development, Youth Development and Partnerships for Success. Sorry about that. It is Friday morning. Welcome to the last morning of Summit. We are so glad you have been with us all week. We hope you have found this informative and useful and we are excited to move forward. Before I start, I do wanna give a couple really quick thank yous um, as our week comes to the close. First, I wanna thank the administration at OCFS, specifically Commissioner Sheila Poole and Deputy Commissioner Nina Aldort for their continued support um, for all of our anti-human trafficking efforts, specifically um, this summit. I would like to thank my colleagues, my supervisor, Madeline Hare, and our team, Robin and Shannon, for their support in helping pull off this amazing event. Um, I would like to give a very, very, very big thank you to the team at WRI, Lisa, Jean, Darlene, and Jen, who have been instrumental in helping us make this event um, the success that we feel it has been. But most importantly, I want to thank all of you. Um, we couldn't have imagined or hoped for better participation and engagement. Um, your, the fact that you committed to attending as many of these events as you could all week is so indicative of your commitment and dedication to your work and the youth that we all try to serve. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We would not have a summit without you. So with that, I'm gonna do a few quick housekeeping. Uh, if you encounter any IT issues during today's presentation, please send an email to info at welfareresearch.org, or if you're already in the presentation, you can type it in the chat. We will get you help as soon as we can. All of this week's presentations are being recorded and will be posted in HSLC for future viewing. If you need a certificate for any of the uh, presentations you've attended all week, I will type the email address to reach out to in the chat box. You can have any of those by request. Next week, be on the lookout for both a post-summit survey and materials from the presentations. This survey is super important, so we do ask that you take a few minutes to fill it out. It helps guide our work for future events. Lastly, we wanna make sure you know that all participants will be muted during each presentation. Um, the presenter has about 45 minutes worth of content for you with interaction, and then we will allow some time for Q&A. So at the end, if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box, and um, our presenter and I will get to your question. If for some reason we cannot get to your question today, we do get a transcript of all of the questions that were asked, both in the chat and in the Q&A box, and we will get you an answer as soon as possible. Now I would like to introduce this morning's presenter, her name is Aaliyah Howard, and she works as the coordinator for human trafficking services at the International Institute of Buffalo. She is also one of our amazing safe harbor partners and coordinators from Erie County, and she leads the community collaborations focused on identifying needs, gaps in services, and supports for at-risk and trafficked youth. She's a regular presenter to groups about human trafficking and coordinates service provision for adult and youth survivors in Erie County and across Western New York. I am super excited she's here, here with us today and I'm gonna go have some more coffee. <laughs> so I'm gonna hand it over to Aaliyah. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for the invitation. I'm super excited to be joining summit again this year um, and being able to speak with all of you even though we're remote and that's not what we planned on um, but I do appreciate the opportunity to talk through this with all of you. So as Christine mentioned um, we're going to be talking a little bit about our well a lot of it about our transition to doing remote work with trafficked and at-risk youth specifically around supporting youth who are AWOL through through this time of COVID and and um, whatever comes next. I do wanna give credit where credit is due. Um, I want to shout out to my colleague who is not able to present with me this morning as we had planned, but Melissa Serena is an amazing youth case manager who's done a lot of work with the, the youth whose case situations or case presentations we'll be reviewing this morning. 
um, and helped with some of the content here. So I want to give her some credit. My contact information is there. And of course, all of this will go up to folks afterwards. So please feel free to reach out and, and have additional conversation. I love talking about doing youth work. I love talking about human rights approaches to anti-trafficking work in the United States. And so I'm happy to have lots and lots of these conversations with folks. So I want to let folks know that we are based out of the International Institute of Buffalo, where we've been doing resettlement work in Western New York for over 100 years at this point. Um, we started doing anti-trafficking work in about 2007. We're the co-facilitators of the Human Trafficking Task Force of the Western District of New York, which is a mouthful, but it's one of those big multidisciplinary teams that does anti-trafficking work in terms of identification and awareness, survivor support services, and then the investigation and prosecution piece of it. So when New York State started funding, OCFS started funding counties to do anti-trafficking work, it really seemed like the, the International Institute was going to be a good fit to be able to start doing that work for youth where we are and where we're from. So as we have our conversation over the next 50 minutes or so this morning, um, we're going to talk about the frames from which we engage with youth, the frames that guide our anti-trafficking work with trafficked and at-risk youth, because that really shapes what we're doing and how we're doing it. It shapes, it shapes the strategies we engage in. Um, and I think that that's going to be helpful information for folks that are, that are either interested in approaching work with AWOL youth, um, new programs, or I think as refreshers. You know, we're, we're in anti-trafficking work and in these conversations locally and across the state and across the country and we're always learning um, so hopefully some of these frames can be helpful for you all as well we're going to talk about specific strategies for staying connected with runaway and AWOL youth and how we've adapted those during COVID, including some of the technology supports, because I will share that what we anticipated our technology work to look like on March 16th, when we all transitioned to working from home, it's not what we see happening now, right? We've, we've learned some lessons and I'm happy to share those with you both in terms of what has worked and what has not worked. Um, and I really want to highlight through the course of this conversation, the really critical role of having trusted and trauma-informed partnerships. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more through that because we all do great work. And I trust that the folks that are on this call are all doing good work. And none of us can or should be doing every aspect of every support with every youth we connect with, right? We are experts in the areas we work in. And it helps us and it helps our staff and it helps the clients, most importantly, that we're connecting with. Um, to be able to have multiple safe, supportive relationships with adults and programs. And I know we all know that. So as we move forward, we're going to do some polls. We're going to have some discussion. Please feel free to use that chat box. Christine is keeping an eye on that for us. We'll do some case presentations um, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A before Madeline comes on and, and wraps us up with the end of the summit. So we'll go ahead and get started. So Jean, will you go ahead and pop up those poll questions for us? I will remind folks that these are anonymous poll questions, survey responses. No one's going to know that they were yours. So please feel free to honest them, um, to answer them honestly. Where we are now. So please, if you haven't, go ahead and enter your responses into those polls, and then Jean's going to close it up for us when we hit about 50% um, or so participation. Okay. So when we talk about how comfortable your program or agency is working with AWOL youth, 
So we've got a good mix. This is great. I'm, I'm excited and pleasantly surprised. So most of us are either somewhat comfortable or very comfortable in terms of a program. Um, and then when we're talking about ourselves, our personal responses into doing this work, we've got more folks that are somewhat comfortable, slightly less that are very comfortable. But again, the majority of us are comfortable working with youth while they're AWOL. And then um, I'm glad to see that 75% of us or so are allowed to work with youth while they're runaway and AWOL. Um, and then I will acknowledge that 25% of us on this call on this on this Zoom training are not allowed to or able to work with AWOL youth. And I'll share that that's a really common frame or a common message that we get from other providers in our own community. So I think that it's helpful for us to recognize that while we want to be supporting youth while they're running away, while they're AWOL, in and out of placements, etc., not all of us are able to as our programs currently stand. And many of our partners that we rely on to do good work in terms of trauma treatment, in terms of preventive services, might not be able to do that. So it's definitely something that we need to keep in mind as we're, as we're navigating service maps for youth while they're AWOL. Thanks, Jean. All right. So let me back us up a little bit and really provide a foundation of the frames that we're working from. And I think a lot of these are going to be familiar for those of us who have been doing anti-trafficking work longer. Um, and when we're working with youth specifically, some of them adapt to look a little bit different, but the values and the frames are all here. So again, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions through the chat box pop them in there, we're going to save time for Q&A, but I want to be able to provide this foundation and this kind of introduction to how we work with youth. So obviously we are providing trauma-informed care. I'm sure that everyone on this call have either written a million grants talking about how we provide trauma-informed care or we're training staff, um, but I highlight it because we really do interweave being trauma-informed into every aspect of our youth work. And we use the SAMHSA's six core values model that does incorporate that value of cultural and gender and historical issues and needs into our understanding of trauma-informed care. Because as we recognize that those root causes and key vulnerabilities for trafficking are based in poverty and family conflict and some of these bigger oppression and um, other dynamics that we see on that kind of society level, having that additional understanding into providing trauma-informed care and services and what some of those barriers to accessing other resources might be for our clients is something that's really important as we continue to weave this in. You know, we could, we could talk a lot about being aware of stages of change and aspects of motivational interviewing and how those interact and weave in also with being trauma informed in our work with youth. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep to time. So I'm gonna move forward and talk a little bit about that human rights approach to anti-trafficking work because we do approach our, our youngest clients in you know, 9, 10, 11 years old to teenagers, to adults in that human rights frame because we know that victims of crimes, including human trafficking, have rights. Our clients have rights. They have a right to accessing a New York State confirmation letter when they meet that definition of being trafficked as youth. Um, we work in frames of, of youth autonomy and talking through choices. We have lots and lots of really clear, really honest conversations about what human trafficking is, what vulnerability is, and do a lot of work around rights and choice, right? Because our goal in working with youth and supporting youth is to help them be safer so we can reduce those vulnerabilities, right? As their teens, as their moving into young adulthood and as they're adults, right? So building those decision-making skills in ways that are going to be more informed and help build towards safety are all things that are woven into that human rights approach to, to anti-trafficking work. We know that it doesn't work to take kids' phones to keep them safer. We know that locking them up doesn't keep them safer in the long run, right? And so these are the approaches that we take that help us support youth better and that obviously melds into that idea and that frame of, of really doing harm reduction work. In child welfare systems, I think that that's more commonly referred to as being risk tolerant, but harm reduction is, is beyond where it started in, in HIV work, in substance abuse work. Harm reduction is working towards safety in whatever element or whatever aspect of a youth or a client's life we're talking about, right? So ways to stay safer 
right? And again, keeping in mind those stages of change that model around meeting youth where they are and helping build towards safety. How are we bridging youth back to other systems, whether it's a guardian or a foster parent or a county guardian or children's services or a placement? How are we building bridges back to folks? And we're gonna talk about some of those strategies specifically that have been really successful during COVID, um, but we're really working towards that model of, of harm reduction. And again, I do wanna highlight that element of having truly trauma-informed and trusted partnerships. And those are partnerships that are built on the long term, right? We maintain good communication with our partners. We let them know um, what we're doing and how we're doing it. And so when we have a case where we've got a young person who needs support, um, we want to be able to talk them through what to expect and give them realistic understanding of what to expect. And sometimes that looks like having a relationship with a provider that means that they'll see a young person for a physical exam in the middle of a pandemic with a guinea pig in that young person's purse because she didn't feel safe enough to go without one of her companion animals and we were able to um, help make that guinea pig the safer choice rather than have her try to walk into a doctor's appointment with her pit bull who would have not allowed her to be seen at that moment, right? So a lot of that um, working with and collaborating with youth and you're gonna hear in interwoven with all of these frames and in the case presentations that we're going to talk through, um, that relationship is really key, right? So you're gonna hear themes of setting safe and respectful boundaries around our communication in real life and through technology. And you're gonna see and hear how some of that relationship um, really, again, guides that work. Because for many of the youth that we work with, whether they're, they're coming to work with our program as being high risk or if they're disclosing trafficking, this might be one of the first relationships in a long time, if not ever, that's really modeled on communication, respectful communication, healthy boundaries and safety. All right, so I wanna start through some of our case reviews, okay? Um, I will let you know that we did talk with all three of the youth whose cases we're talking through during this presentation. We did give them the opportunity to pick an alias, which I thought was really cool. And I was told that that was not cool at all. I expected we would be doing like a, a presentation on Rihanna or Beyonce would be case review one. And that is not true. That is not cool. Um, in case anybody was looking at their cool points this week. So in our first case that we'll just call case review one, some of the background in this story was that, um, you know, this youth had a, a, a lot of really significant barriers to accessing services, a lot of challenges in working with us. She was referred to work with us when she was 16 by our local child protection through the Child Advocacy Center. Um, she had been working with us as I, as identified it as being high risk for about 16 months before she disclosed that she had in fact been trafficked and we were able to do some of those New York State confirmation and, and other pieces as well. Um, which really shows that length of time and that, that relationship and that trust that needed to be built for her to make that disclosure. And again, that's going to be a common theme as we're working with youth who are engaging in AWOL behavior. So there were red flags from the outset in terms of her relationship with her guardian. Um, she really st struggled in that she was really on that cusp between accessing and receiving services in two counties where a guardian wasn't safe, but not so safe she couldn't be removed. She'd been in and out of systems. She'd been in and out of foster care. There were lots and lots of barriers and lots and lots of um, really extensive trauma history that led her to to making the choices that her finding pe people herself to stay with was the better choice for her at that time, right? She's since in a different place and we're working on permanent housing and it is doing very, very well. Um, but I did wanna provide some of that background to you all. And when we're, when we're looking at services and supports, right? Because this is just kind of that demographic background information, you know, it, it helps, I think, to frame our services knowing that she had been AWOL for years and in and out of systems for years by the time she was referred to connect with our program. 
So when we're talking about support strategies and engagement with her, I will, I will share and be very honest that engagement started really slowly and really superficially with her for a long time. It took a long time of work and consistent work and consistent boundaries with her to start making any real, any disclosures about the trauma she'd experienced, about accessing services. A lot of her exploitation looked like threats that systems were going to report her, that she was going to go to jail if she asked for help, that no one would be able to believe her. Like a lot of that exploitation really looked like her not being allowed to or encouraged to feel able to ask for help or seek services from people that were systems involved. So a lot of that early engagement was, you know, a text message here or a text message there. We were able to start doing meetings with her in restaurants where she would almost inevitably bring a guinea pig or bring a pet rabbit in her purse to a cafe or to a restaurant for a meeting. Um, but those were ways that she was able to feel safer. And through the course of our engagement with her, we did get those disclosures that trafficking had happened um, quite some time before the referral and she was engaging in survival sex um, more recently, including during the beginning of COVID. Um, but that staying connected looks like for her having a really set schedule of contact with our program. So for her having a mid morning every single Monday and having a Friday afternoon, every single Friday afternoon set conversation time with her dedicated case manager is what's most helpful for her. She needs that kind of bookend for the week or planning around weekends, planning on um, knowing who's going to call her when and what that's going to look like has been really helpful. And of course, she engages around um, if something else comes up, they're doing a lot of text messaging. In terms of technology, one of the, the most helpful things that we've done with her has been able to keep her phone bill paid so she can speak to her doctor that we got her linked up with that we'll circle back to in a moment, that she's been able to keep in contact with CPS workers when investigations have been open and other partners as we've helped her develop those relationships. Um, we've done, she does like Facebook. Um, she's not so into video chats and video calls, but she's doing um, some Facebook chatting. And that was really how she allowed us to introduce new partners to her. We introduced her to some medical social workers and some other providers first by Facebook chat. So she could see that we were there. She could see that we knew what was being said. It was a really support mechanism for her to be able to have her case manager, who she already trusted, involved in those communications. Um, and then after a few weeks of that kind of group chat, she was then willing to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with that new provider. Um, our work with her has changed in, in the time of COVID and that we're not having regular weekly meetings with her right now. Um, we've sent lots and lots of care packages. We've done a lot of Amazon delivery, very honestly, in terms of being able to, to meet the needs that she has for coping strategies, for self-care, for kind of maintaining her sense of self through COVID and maintaining her physical health as well. Um, in the key partnerships that I really wanna highlight and work with her are around um, both reproductive health and seeking domestic violence services. So at the beginning of COVID, um, our area in Western New York had opened up to, I believe, phase one at that point. So, so non-emergent medical appointments were able to be made, but advocates weren't allowed to come in. Um, it was, you know, it was, we were just starting to open up and she disclosed that she needed to be seen. She was worried about having a, a yeast infection and she needed to see a doctor. And so because we had a partnership with um, this specific reproductive health care center where we knew that they would see her without ID because she doesn't have ID yet, um, they were able to see her without having her proof of insurance and all of that other kind of required documentation that one would normally expect to have to provide to be able to access medical care. We knew that they were going to see her and we knew that through this partnership that if and when she did show up with a bunny or a guinea pig that they would still see her. We knew that we were not going to be able to get a pit bull into their waiting room and we weren't able to, spend, to send staff with her to to kind of mitigate that, that concern either. Um, so having that relationship was allowed her to get in for that piece of care 
And since then, because that went well, because she trusted how that went and it and what happened looked like what we said was going to happen, right? That, that element of trustworthiness through trauma-informed care. She's since been able to make, um, as things have continued to, uh, to open up in COVID, she's since been able to make multiple follow-up appointments for a regular physical exam that she hadn't had in years. You know, she's got a dental appointment coming up, right? She's, because that went well, because we had that solid partnership and she saw that she could access services safely, she's then been able to start reaching out and, and expand that kind of world of possibilities. So one other thing that I'll note that is, is true in this youth situation and also really represents a lot of other youth that, that have worked with us over the years is that as they get closer to 18 and less concerned about um, going back to group home or less concerned about going back to a guardian that doesn't feel safe or supportive, um, we, we get a lot more disclosures. So right before this youth's 18th birthday, she did disclose the name of her trafficker who was also a domestic violence perpetrator. And so since then, um, right in a couple of weeks before her 18th birthday and ongoing, she's been able to link with domestic violence advocates. Um, she's been able to link with additional services. Um, and, and because we've been able to have that relationship with her to support for this length of time, um, we're, we're looking at some really remarkable outcomes that we wouldn't necessarily have anticipated maybe a year ago. Like I said, she's working on accessing permanent supportive housing, which is really exciting. And the person that has trafficked her is not going to be in a position to harm any other young people, which is really exciting. So let me move forward. I wanna outline some of the tools we used in a second case review. So this young person was referred to us when she was 14. Again, lots of red flags, lots of engagement in foster care settings, lots of engagement in group home and residential facility settings. Um, this is a young person who was first trafficked by a family member when she was very, very young, removed from that family member's care, and then did experience trafficking again um, in, the, in recent years in her early teens. Um, you know, she's got another sibling that is also in these systems and, and being able to see her has been something that's both been a support and been something that's really hard. One of the factors that she identified as being a major uh, precursor to her most recent AWOL was not being able to see that sibling because of COVID when all of the residential facilities in our area locked down, right? Um, so there are lots of pieces of system involvement in this case, like there are with so many of the, the runaway and AWOL youth that all of us are supporting or wanting to support. And, and support strategies with her really looked a lot like, um, you know, leveraging the relationships she does have with a foster care agency that she feels really good about, that she trusts, She's got workers that she remains in regular contact with. She's got a great relationship with her children's services worker who's been consistent for a long time. And so we've done a lot more three-way meetings, a lot more kind of case conferences to keep engagement and to keep support with her and to stay connected. Her preferred technology is through Facebook. She loves to be able to do the, the call feature through there when she's on Wi-Fi. She loves to be able to do group chats with folks that she that are providers that she feels safe with um, and to do those calls in those ways. So again, we've been able to keep her phone on so she can stay engaged with her safe family members and her service providers as we're trying to bridge her back into care again. Um, we were recently almost able to get her back into a runaway homeless youth services provider and are continuing to work on more long-term plans with children's services with her. So some of the, the challenges to remote work with her have been really that she's, um, she's trying really hard to not go back into placement and really wants to, to move directly into foster care, which is something that's um, got some additional barriers for her, but it's something that she's working forward and continuing with. So we're doing lots and lots of safety planning with her, lots and lots of support work with her. Um, and a lot of that is through those private Facebook features and through some texting with her. 
some of the partnerships that we've pulled in and really maintained again these are these are trusted partnerships that take ongoing work to maintain um, we've got MOUs in place, we've got long term agreements where we train each other's staff and how services work. Um, but like I mentioned, so the children's services worker has been incredibly helpful and supportive with her. They've got a great relationship and maintain very consistent communication, whether this youth is in placement or whether she's AWOL or whether she's staying with other friends um, before and between engaging more formally with systems of care. Um, She's linked with a voluntary agency around some of the foster placement work um, and the worker for there is, is part of a program that's not supposed to be working and communicating directly with youth while they're AWOL. And she's done a lot of work to advocate in her program with, her, um, with their policies and procedures to change what that looks like and to be able to maintain ethical, according to her program's rules, um, support for this young person. So she does continue to feel very supported, which is fantastic. Um, and I will highlight um, additionally a social work program that we have been doing a lot of work with, especially during COVID. Um, one of our major hospital systems has a social work team embedded in their hospital settings. So when we're able to, to have a young person or an adult, honestly, go into receive those medical services, we can have one of the social workers from their program meet a client at the door, talk them through, make sure that they have a safe and quiet place to wait for services and engage. They've been really invaluable partners, especially during COVID when we can't have staff go to medical appointments as we normally would, and as it's been much harder for folks in our communities to be able to seek regular primary care. So while this young person didn't need an ER visit, she didn't have access to be able to see a primary care doctor. So by being able to have that trusted partnership in the hospital systems, she was able to really have that trusted experience. We were able to link her with our program's medical social worker through that piece of things and really showing her that a community of adults, a community of programs, believe her and trust her and see her value as a human being as we work together to, to support her safety has been something that's been really successful for her. Her seeing how many people are involved in case conferences and case reviews and, and having conference calls with her and about her situation has been something that's been, um, according to her, very, very helpful. Um, and it's really exciting because we don't see that every time when we're working with and supporting AWOL youth. All right, so let's talk technology. We are not seeing what we thought we would see when we transitioned to COVID. Um, but before I, I kind of talk more about that, I'm gonna ask Jean to pop up our second block of polling questions. Jean, can you pop those up for you or for us? All right, so these are really around, you know, what are you able to do or not able to do in your work role in terms of accessing these technologies to maintain communication with young people.
Okay, it sounds like we're having lots of tech issues, so I apologize. Um, and we'll get back up on the computer as soon as I can to share that, that, that PowerPoint with you. All right, so let's take a look at these polling questions. So do you, does your program have rules against texting youth? So many of you don't, this is fantastic. Um, many of you are Hi guys, this is Christine. I'm just gonna pop in and share some answers. Said we um, were very uncomfortable, which is really exciting. Okay, and we again have a majority of us that are either very comfortable or somewhat comfortable when we're engaging with youth while we're communicating. All right, so let me close out this poll here. Looks like my internet is going to start back up again. All right, I think I'm back up and running. Great. Again, my apologies. I had joked around the water department being um, two doors down from my house doing a lot of work and I assumed that it would not be an issue but today it was. So thanks for your patience as we get back up and running. Give me just a moment. All right. Again, thank you for your patience. I'm really excited to see so many folks on this call be able to be engaging in some of this technology use with young folks. Um, I know from talking to some providers and other programs in our community locally that that's not always the case. You know, um, Providers will often ask us to get linked or stay linked with young people while they're, um, while they're AWOL specifically because they're not supposed to be texting, they're not supposed to be engaging or they're not able to engage over social media or other platforms. Um, and that really has made a world of difference with us while we're supporting youth. It's been, it's been incredibly helpful. So the, the work for us in a non-COVID or pre-COVID world looks a lot like having one-on-one -on -one in-person meetings with young people in fast food places and restaurants in cafes, in schools, in homes, um, in many of those other places in residential settings. Wherever youth were, we were able to go and have those meetings. I used to joke around um, being really worried about how much caffeine our case managers were drinking because they're having so many meetings with young people in Tim Hortons is, is the favorite for youth in Erie County, if anyone was wondering. Um, and obviously phone work and, and Facebook and things like that. When we transitioned to COVID, I had expected ignorantly um, that we were gonna be doing every meeting with young person that we would have done in person over a video chat. I assumed that, that our youth clients were going to love doing Zoom calls, that they were going to be um, doing WhatsApp video calls with us all the time. I really thought we were gonna be doing video calls left and right. Um, and that's not what, what most of our youth have wanted to do. We've done a lot of text messaging. Our, our youth case managers are texting with clients many times throughout the day, several times a week with much higher frequency than they would have um, before COVID. So having lots more shorter bits of contact as they work towards goals and practicing coping strategies and working towards developing safety and things like that. Um, you know, so a lot of that work for us is through either regular text messaging apps. We do a lot of WhatsApp, a lot of the um, text platforms that can run over Wi-Fi, because if we're um, if we're working with youth, they don't always have access to cell phones, or, or I'm sorry, they don't always ac have access to like minutes and phone plans. So that Wi-Fi phone kind of service is often how we're connecting with folks. Um, our youth staff do have work Facebook accounts where we've got the, the privacy settings really locked down. We're reviewing that and then we're modeling how to do that technology work more safely with youth and having those conversations. Um, we did get a referral um, about two months into COVID for a young person who had just AWOLed from placement and the placement facility only had her Snapchat 
And so we did develop a work Snapchat for those few weeks before, before she came back into care and we could use some more traditional technology ways to communicate with her. Um, we've got one young person who loves to respond and work with us in, in TikTok videos. Every time his case manager checks in around um, their next meeting or they're scheduling something, his response is in the form of a really creatively and, and emotionally vulnerable TikTok video, which is very interesting and in that I never thought that I would be speaking to a group of, of professionals doing youth work saying, yeah, I, we have youth who only communicate in TikTok and then they have their regularly scheduled meetings, but really everything in between is, is on TikTok. It's very, very interesting. And so while we're engaging in this, this bigger variety and this bigger diversity of technology tools with folks, we're really, again, modeling what safety looks like throughout. We're talking about boundaries, we're maintaining boundaries just because we're accessing um, these social media platforms and these web tools and these apps to communicate and we're working from home because of course all of our clients know that. we there, there wouldn't have been a reason to or an ability to not share that with them. We're still setting that boundary that our program works from nine to five, Monday through Friday. And if there's something that folks need after those hours, they know who to call, right? That's part of how we work with young folks is that this is when we're available. We will respond back to you that first day when we come back into the office, if we've been out. And if you need something in the meantime, you know, here are the people to call. Here's who to call when you need somebody to talk to. Here's somebody to call when you feel like you need additional support. Here's the, the drop-in centers information. We provide all of that information. And so we're again, modeling all of those boundaries and all of that work with youth as we're engaging in all of these pieces of technology. So I would invite before we transition to doing Q&A and having some more conversation together, I would really invite folks to think through um, what your program's response could be if when we finish up Summit this morning, you get back to your, your home office or your voicemail or, or your office office if you're back in your buildings. Um, you know, if and when you get a referral for this young person I'm gonna outline in just a moment, how would you be able to engage and stay connected? Do you and your staff have the tools that you need, the training you need to, to work with them? And how would that be different based on where your region is in terms of COVID response? Um, and I'd like to, to kind of introduce this third young person that we're, that we're connected with. Um, she is currently using she, she, her pronouns. She's a gender fluid 14 year old who again has been in and out of systems of care for a very long time. Um, recently AWOL'd from placement to go stay with a family member who's not yet approved by the county, which is her guardian to be where she's staying. Um, She's doing a lot of a lot of safety work, navigating a lot of kind of cultural vulnerabilities with with our case manager, with the family member she's staying with. She's having lots and lots of conversations with with her county worker, which is great. Um, but again, I would invite you to to look at your program either now as we're talking or put responses into the chat box. Do you have the tools you need to work with and support? a gender fluid 14 year old who's AWOL from care in month 847 million of COVID. And if not, um, are there policies and procedures that you can go back to work and advocate around? Are there additional trainings that you would like to implement for your staff? You know, there are tons of resources available. As much as I will complain along with everyone else around doing more Zoom trainings. There's so many resources available to be able to brush up on our skills if we don't feel like we have that capacity um, to work with and support youth in the same ways that we wanted. And one tool that I'll, that I'll share while folks are thinking about that is that we've been able to have really productive meetings with youth, either youth in care or youth while they're still AWOL with their county workers over Zoom in ways that I didn't ever think that we would be able to do that. A lot of that communication normally looks like um, three-way calls where nobody's in the same room, but we were able to recently do 
um, a Zoom call with a young person and her county worker around what her options are for coming back into care and how that could look, which was really exciting. All right, so again, feel free to put some of those responses into, into the chat box, into the Q&A, um, because I guarantee that, that we are not the only county being asked to work with youth who are in these positions. All right, so let me go ahead and look at some of these Q&A boxes or some of these chats that Christine has put in for me. Oh, Christine, when I got kicked off of Zoom for a minute, I lost my Q&A questions. Could you read those out or could you copy paste those back in for me? Sure. Thank you, I apologize. That's okay. They're still up. Can you get to the Q&A box, Aaliyah? Can you see it? I can see it, but it's empty. Interesting. Okay. I Yeah, um, it's because they were in there from before I got kicked off. Again, everybody, I apologize for my neighborhood's bear, construction. Bear with me. Two of them we can hold till, oh, here we go. I'll just read them to you. How about that? Perfect. Thank you. All right. Let me put myself on video so I'm not like the great wizard of Oz right now. Okay, and I'll stop sharing. Great. Hi guys. Okay, first question. I work specifically with LGBTQ youth in a rural area and a lot of them have unsupportive home environments and want or need to get out but aren't able to be emancipated or fully independent yet. How can I support them when I don't have parental consent to speak with their caseworkers or local resources as an advocate and what rights do youth have to get that support and then leave? That's a great question. Those are fantastic questions. And it gets a lot harder when you're working in rural areas during COVID, right? I yeah. mean, some of the hardest youth, there's some of the hardest times we've had staying connected with young people is when they're living in rural areas and don't have access to Wi-Fi. They don't have access to like, reliable cell phone coverage. And that's mm -hmm. absolutely been a hard thing. So I'll share that one of the things that we find most successful when we're talking with guardians is that um, that kind of frame of our work with youth, right? Our primary client is that young person. And once we've got parents okay and buy in to meet with them, we don't need the parent to or the guardian to be present at those meetings. We don't need them to call us four times a week. Really, our work is with that young person. And we will often frame it as, you know, let us help with these vulnerabilities. Let's help us um, let's help kind of build their safety and you don't have to do anything. All we need from a parent guardian is for them to help us, you know, can we pay for a phone for them? And then we'll obviously talk around safety and limits and, and access and all of those things. Right. Um, but we'll pay for it. Like all we need is your permission to, to be able to do those pieces. And that has often been very successful because so many of the families we're connected with have an abundance of providers who are all asking the parents to do one more thing, right? right. Be present for three home visits a week and then have this many call-ins to your probation or PINs officer, right? We're all trying to right. do good work. And, and sometimes it's a lot of lift on the parents and guardians. I'll share that that's been the most helpful. And then a lot of, we do a lot of information providing. You know, if a young person can't get to um, their, their local gay, les gay lesbian youth services provider, um, mm -hmm. are they allowed to have an hour or two hours a day of internet access where we can link them up with supports online, safe supports online, right? right? So they can build community in safe ways. Those are things that we found to be really successful. That's awesome. I do just want to remind people, questions can be typed either in the chat and I can relay them or the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. It has two little word bubbles and it says Q&A. That is a great segue to the next question. Um, you mentioned that you paid for a phone for one of the youth. We do this, but usually through purchasing a phone and minute cards and then giving them the minute cards as needed. How are you working this with that specific youth paying for a plan or somehow giving them the cards with the minutes on them? So since COVID especially, we've been doing a lot more of the services 
that you can just put minutes on it instead of a physical card. It's an electronic where you just can, can sign up for it and put the pin all in it online, which has been way more successful. We've had a lot of challenges with getting mail to folks on time, as I'm sure many of you have as well. Um, and so even if it's been a matter of, of switching somebody's phone plan, keeping their number and, and doing all of that safely, of course, we've been able to switch those to providers that will allow us to pay for it online. So we don't have to hand somebody a physical card, you know, right. and, and food cards and, and deliveries and all of that. We're doing a lot of that remotely. Um, hooray for the internet. That's, it has its perks. That's for sure. Sometimes we're not, technology is not our friend, but in these times, it definitely can be. And that leads up to, I'm gonna loop back to a comment that um, was sent in the chat earlier when we were talking about ways that they keep connected. And one of our participants, I'm trying to find it, mentioned that an issue they had was that as the youth would AWOL, they change their phone number or they their phone gets disconnected. So in those circumstances, Aaliyah, um, what systems do you have in place to try to reconnect with the youth? Or do you find that the youth then will make the effort to try to reconnect with you in any way they can? Both of those, absolutely. That's a great question, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of our safety planning from the very beginning with young people, especially when we know that they've engaged in AWOL behavior before, is making sure that they know that we can continue working with them for as long as they want to. We can work with them in placement or at home or in foster care or AWOL. And so they'll save our number somewhere. So they will often reach back out to us, even if they've fired us very colorfully four days beforehand. Um, they will often mm -hmm. rehire us and, and relink in those ways. Um, and we keep those same youth case manager phone numbers, period, right? And so even if we've had two staff changes since then, we've got folks calling us that worked with our, their, our case manager four or five or six years ago who are 18 now, they wanna engage in adult services because they kept that phone number. Even though it's coming to a different person, they know that that number is, um, is connected with somebody who's safe. And we'll certainly reach out through other providers when we're able to, but generally youth will call us or they'll message us on a Wi-Fi to be able to bridge back in, in that way as well. Thanks. Great. I'm also really surprised that nobody wanted to be Beyonce because who I doesn't? So. Who doesn't want to be Beyonce? I mean, uh, I would every jump teenager the that we offered it to. Man, I don't know what's going on out there in Western New York, but I would I, I would vote to be Beyonce. Yeah. Um, on that on that note, I'm going to say thank you to Aaliyah. If you have mm -hmm. further questions Thanks, for Aaliyah that we didn't get to, you can shoot me an email. The email address is in the chat box. We will get you a response. I'm actually going to turn it over to Madeline Hare for some final wrap up. Thank you, Aaliyah. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm just so energized by all of these presentations and I love, Aaliyah, how you framed at the very end um, young people firing and rehiring um, because that's really when we talk about where the youth's at and youth-led services and positive youth development and voice, I mean, that's really what it's about, right? We, we can get fired and hired unlimited times and that's okay. We're still here to offer the same things. Um, so we are at the end of our summit. It's been a week of really fantastic presentations. Um, what I wanted to do with this last 10 minutes is to highlight some of the themes that we identified that came out over all of these presentations and then connect them to some questions um, that hopefully lead to action steps and make us think about opportunities. We're not um, sharing information for information's sake. The purpose of sharing information is really to put it to use to help serve young people better. So I have five themes that um, I wanna just make sure we lift up before we close. The first one is vulnerability. Um, we know that the young people who are connected to our services are vulnerable. And we also know that COVID has really exacerbated those vulnerabilities for young people and their families. Um, we heard about how COVID is making young people more desperate, more willing to take more risks um, for less money. We know that young people are being approached in all kinds of ways that we maybe hadn't considered before through things like Minecraft and uh, Fortnite and 
all the other apps that some of us are very familiar with, whereas others maybe are hearing about them for the first time. So just really being, um, feeling the weight of that vulnerability. And so the questions for opportunities that I wanna have folks leave with is, what are your programs doing to meet the basic needs of young people, right? If we know that young people are going to take more risks to make money so that they can meet the needs of themselves and their families or their loved ones, how can we meet those needs with them or for them to prevent that exploitation from happening? So for those of you who have access to safe harbor dollars, which really every county has um, at this point is, are you buying gift cards for grocery stores to keep on hand so that when young people present, you can hand them out? Have you connected with all of the providers in your community where young people go and make sure they have a food shelf stocked all the time? Have we provided phone minutes for young people? Have we considered paying security deposits for our young adults who are um, really at risk of homelessness, which is a huge correlate with trafficking vulnerabilities? So that's the first theme. The second we identified is prevention. Prevention came up in probably every presentation. And one of the things that jumped out to us from one of the presentations was that 20 to 30% of young people who are surveyed as young as nine years old, 20 to 30% of nine year olds, had already been exposed to nudes and sex in some way, whether it was their own or whether it was they received or were aware of those of their peers. So prevention is obviously a really important part of our work. So the question for action is, what is your program doing around prevention education? Um, we have for a long time as a system had conversations about healthy relationships, boundaries, consent. Are we making sure that the virtual landscape is folded into those conversations and not treating them as distinct? One of the things that is very clear is that our virtual and digital landscape is not an extension, or excuse me, not separate from real life, but it is an extension of real life. So we can't treat them as needing a separate conversation, right? It should be folded in from day one. Healthy boundaries exist in person and also online. We also heard from some of our pre presentations that prevention grounded in this doomsday fear kind of messaging is not effective. If we tell young people, if you do X, Y, Z, you'll never get a job, or no one will be able to help you, that doesn't create pathways forward, right? So the prevention that we do want to put forward is prevention that ha opens up doors rather than closing them. So that if young people do need to reach out, they know that they can, and they know where to go to do that. Which leads into intervention. The third theme that I heard um, brought up several times is that when young people need an intervention, when something has already happened, just how intense the fear of shame and stigma is in preventing a disclosure. One of the presenters I think said, not only are they um, concerned about the shame and stigma that we already know about and talk about, but also now you're adding the layer of being a snitch, right? Your peers are doing it, so you can't really, um, ask for help without getting someone else in trouble. So how do we message around that, that our role is here to support you and help keep you safe, right? Safer today than you were yesterday, safer tomorrow than you are today. That's really what we're here to help them build. So how does your program do that? Um, the fourth kind of theme that we identified is just how incredibly creative and innovative our Safe Harbor programs are. Again, not a surprise, but still very exciting to see it played out. Um, so we heard from Chautauqua about their use of Facebook. We heard from New York City about uh, virtual DBT groups. We heard from Orange and Sullivan about TikTok and YouTube. Um, and we heard from Erie today about really similar platforms. Um, case management communications on TikTok is not something we would have necessarily thought about in 2019. So, what policies does your agency have around communicating with young people virtually? What awareness campaigns has your program developed or lifted up? You don't even need to invent your own, but what already exists that you can tag into and elevate? How are you using uh, technology? 
through your agency and your program and how can you do it better? Um, and one of the things that I've loved about Safe Harbor from the very beginning is how willing all of our partners are to help each other grow. So please, if you saw a presentation this week that you wanna talk more about, reach out to them. Um, everyone is here to share information and strategies and lessons learned. So this is something that is very doable um, and we want you to give it a try. Uh, and lastly, the, the final theme that we lifted out was cyber civics. So the notion that young people have always been and will always be ahead of us olds in the technology department. There's just no way around it. Don't try to catch up. And just because they know how to use the technology doesn't mean that they are well prepared to deal with the outcomes or the impacts of those interactions that happen virtually. So the outcomes of bullying online, they still need help navigating. The outcomes or impacts of receiving sex they didn't want, they still need help navigating that. Um, so recognizing that it's not an all or nothing, um, that it's very doable for us, that many times we're already having those conversations, just making sure we're bridging that IRL and the digital virtual. So action step question to think about, how are you doing that? And how are you having young people's voice incorporated into the way you do it? Are you engaging young people around your use of social media, digital technologies, um, communications that are happening online? So, I hope that we have left you inspired. Um, I know we are certainly energized. Thank you again to all of our presenters. Thank you to WRI for all your tech support and facilitation. Thank you, Christine, for all of your work organizing this. We will be sending out resources probably next week to include the resources shared by the presenters to share the follow-up survey. We'd love to hear from you. We mentioned this is our first virtual event, so we really wanna know how did it go? Um, is it worth doing again? What do you think? Please do fill that out. Um, the recordings will be uploaded to HSLC for ongoing use, so those will be available to you. I did also wanna just put a pin in Aaron's Law. So this is a piece of legislation that went into effect this past summer. It requires that public schools teach child sex abuse and exploitation prevention from K through eight, meaning the schools now have a responsibility to embed prevention into their materials and they're gonna need help to do that. So one other action step or thing to pull forward is to make sure you are communicating with your schools. If you have not already, ask them about Aaron's Law ask them how they're putting it into place and can you be a support in that? Um, because the folks on this uh, webinar series and the summit really do have the expertise um, and we wanna make sure that you're part of the conversation going forward. So with that, we are going to close the summit. Thank you all for listening in. We really appreciate it. And if you have questions, comments, concerns, Human trafficking at ocfs.ny.gov is where you can reach Christine, myself, and our whole team. Um, and stay tuned for, for those emails next week. So have a great week, everybody. Take care. <laughs>